John Kelsey. Um, I'm, I work at NIST. I'm also a PhD student here as of, well, I think officially as of like a day ago or something. I was admitted to the program a couple months ago. Um, so I'm really old to be a PhD student. I don't know, I'm doing my career in reverse. So first I did the, all my papers and my work and then I did a PhD here when I'm 50. But <laughs> don't have a good explanation for that other than it seemed like a good idea at the time. So. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, this is one of three talks I'm giving this week. Uh, this talk is about beacons, and I'm really talk, focusing on the beacon project that NIST has done um, over the last few years, but I'm also going to talk about the general idea. So let's just jump in. So um, this is a picture which isn't going to make any sense now, but at the end I'll show it to you, and I hope that this actually makes some sense. This is sort of a process diagram of how the NIST beacon is going to be working um, when we move to the new format in a couple months. So this looks too complicated, and I won't try to explain it all to you now. I'm just going to, hopefully at the end, this will make sense. Um, so what's a beacon? OK, so normally when we talk about random numbers, we talk about um, random numbers we want for private things, like keys or nonsense or something. Um, in this case, we want public random numbers. So a beacon is the source of public random numbers. Uh, we want it to be trustworthy, obviously. We want it, you know, we want it to actually be random. We really want this this property that this we know when the when the number became available. So there's a timestamp on this random number, and it's never released before the timestamp. Okay. Um, we also obviously want things to be you know be kind of verifiable. So it's not enough that it's public like everybody can see. It also needs to be something that we can all agree that the same. We all agree that what the number was. Okay. And then we also want to be stored forever and available forever. Right. So why would we want this? Why would we want something public? There are a bunch of applications for this. I'm not going to try to talk about all the applications. But a few of the things, the original idea goes back to Raven, Michael Raven in, uh, I believe it was 1983, publication 1983. So it's a really old idea. Um, and the idea was to, uh, to help with some protocols. So there's some protocols where it would be nice to have if we have a shared random number, we can make the protocols more efficient. We don't have to interact and, and derive random numbers. So there, there are nice ways of having two or multiple, two or more parties interact and decide on a random number together, but they, they take a lot of communications. It'd be nice to, to just have a single thing. But there are a bunch of other places where you can do this. If we want to randomize some process and show the world, right? I want to demonstrate to the world that I did something in a random way that wasn't under my control. A beacon's really good for that. Um, beacons often kind of solve this court, a kind of a coordination problem. So. One application of this is an election audit. This is the one everybody thinks about, right? So an election audit, um, in the US at least, we tend to have paper ballots, well, the good election systems, the ones that aren't, that don't have big security problems, have paper ballots that are scanned at the, at the precinct and recorded. And then the electronic records are, um, are sent back. And so what you'd like to do to keep that system honest is you'd like to do a random recount of some of those paper ballots. Um, a lot of times people from other countries want to know why we bother with electronic counting in the US because it's not so, it's such a hard thing to just hand count everything. The reason is because we tend to have these very long, complicated ballots. So we tend to have, you, know, you elect at the national, you elect national government, state government, um, local government, you often pass ballot initiatives. So it can be quite a long ballot. That's one of the reasons why it gets electronically counted. Um, but you know, with a with an election audit, what we really want to do is we want to randomly select a subset of these, maybe the precincts, maybe the polling places, and hand recount just those, and want to verify that they they match the electronic count. And you think about this: the reason why we might want a beacon, ideally, well, at least the way we want random public random numbers for this, is we don't want to trust that the election officials did it right. So if you say, well, there's a you know, some part of the existing government that runs the elections and they promise you they did a good recount, they, they randomly selected these, these things to recount, you can't really know for sure that they weren't in on some sort of um, election tampering. And similarly, if you, um, you know, one of the things that's fairly common in a lot of um, US districts, at least, there are two big political parties. So we might have something where the Republicans choose half and the Democrats choose half. Well, that, that works if you assume that the two parties are against each other, but if they're both collaborating, then you don't know what the what the results are. So you'd like something that's public and out of anybody's control. Okay. So another kind of different motivating um, <laughs> application for this is a randomized experiment. Okay. So 
in this case, let's say that I want to do some sort of experiment. Let's say I want to do a medical experiment. Okay, I'm going to do. I'm going to be doing some sort of drug testing, and I'm going to be doing it on. You know, I'm going to select half my patients for the control group, half my patients for the treatment group, something like that. I would like to be able to, to demonstrate to the world that I actually did this selection randomly. That I didn't somehow cook the books and say, well, yeah, all the people with a very with a pretty good prognosis wound up in my treatment group, and so it might, it, my medicine looks better than it really is. Okay? So it'd be nice to be able to show that. So if I just say I just chose a random number and then I ran my, my randomized experiment, you can't really tell, well, maybe I, maybe I tried millions of seeds for my PRNG until I got one that gave me the gave me a win, right? So you want, you, you would like me to, to demonstrate that I chose this random, the, like the seed for my random number generator or something for this experiment in a way that is, you know, outside my control. And you'd like it to be verifiable to the world, okay? So those are two motivating examples. There are actually a whole bunch more. Um, one of the coolest things about, uh, that you can do with a beacon is binding things in time. So if you've ever seen those old movies, I don't have a slide for this, but if you don't have, if you've ever seen those old, like the movies where they show somebody's been kidnapped and he's holding up a picture of the current day's um, newspaper, right? You can do something like that with a beacon. A beacon promises, remember, this is kind of right on the tin, the beacon promises that you will, you'll never release this random number before the time, before a particular time. It's not available until this timestamp. So if you have some number that you can guarantee was not available until exactly 8 p.m. on July 3rd, then you can use that to bind some event in time, a run of a protocol or um, a picture, um, anything that you want to do. And if you then stick, it, stick the result of that into a blockchain or a, um, like a digital timestamping service, you can bind something precisely exactly at this time. So that's a big picture of some of the motivation. So let's talk about a beacon. In particular, our attempt to build a, a, an actual real-world beacon. This is the NIST beacon. So this was proposed in 2011. Um, it started running as a prototype service um, in 2013. I believe it started. That's when we first got it running. Um, and so we've got we've got pulses from all that time. Um, and it's a practical implementation of the beacon idea. This is a very very oversimplified diagram of kind of how this works. Right, so we have the beacon engine, the computer that it's actually running on with a hardware RNG and then a hardware security module, and then it's talking to a local database that's then talking to an external database that's then talking to this web front end, so it's not directly on the internet. There are various things we're, we're doing here, but the idea is to try to build a practical instance of the beacon, right? Um, so the big picture here, you know, this is just the architecture. Um, we want to keep this the engine kind of isolated, so it shouldn't really be talking to a lot of other things, right? So it has to talk to its local database to push things, it has to talk to, it has to get time. Um, so there are a couple things that it has to do, but in general it's going to be isolated. And then it has, like I said, the Intel hardware RNG and the Talus um, hardware security module on board. Um, because I'm a NIST employee, also I think I'm supposed to say, when I mention the names of trademarks, that doesn't imply that the U.S. government thinks they're good or anything. It's just what we used. So, it's not an endorsement. I'm actually, if I set these slides up for my management, they would, they would certainly say you have to put a disclaimer about that. Because that's what we do. So, um, I'm going to show, this is the terminology we use for the rest of this talk. Um, the beacon, I'm going, to I'm going to use the term the beacon to describe the whole surface that provides public random numbers. Okay? The beacon engine is the machine, the actual computer that's producing the random pulses. It's putting them together and finally, you know, create, creating them, signing them, whatever. And then each pulse is one output from the beacon. It's important to have this terminology down because sometimes people say, well, the beacon at time t or something. It's, it's nice to have the, the right, you have a word for everything. So the the idea is that this every pulse has a random number. It's verifiable. It's signed and timestamped and hash chained, and it's it's guaranteed to come out once a minute, I mean, unless the beacon crashes or dies or something. And it's the promise is we won't release this pulse until the time and the timestamp. So the timestamps are on minute boundaries because we issue a pulse once a minute. Okay. So this is a current generation um, beacon pulse, right? So it looks beautiful, right? You can see. The fields, version, frequency, time, a seed value, which is the random, the actual random value, and then you have this output value. And we make a big point that the output value is the thing you should actually be using. So if you're using this pulse, 
you should be using the output value, not the, not the seed value, but the, the output. And I'll explain why that is in a bit. And that's the current, so this is the current version. So we're doing, we're changing things around. We're adding some, we're going to a new version of the Pulse format, and we're also doing several other things. So um, we've got two different organizations, the University of Chile um, and uh, IBM, that are planning to put up their own beacons. And they're going to follow a new format that, we've, that we're, we've, we're working on. I'm going to describe the format. Okay? But we're all going to be following the same Pulse format. And that'll make it easier to do things like combine pulses from different beacons. Um, the changes in the, you know, kind of the changes in the Pulse format are the interesting thing I'm going to talk about next. But I think it's also important to point out the NIST beacon's been running as a prototype service for several years, and we're trying to make it a little more professional. So we're, we actually have professional assistant been running it rather than a rather than just somebody in, in our lab who who's keeping it running. And we're trying to do better, get kind of higher reliability, better security. You know, it's been running on a on a box in a locked room, and it will still be running in a lock box on a on a box in a locked room, but it'll be maybe maybe it'll be a better lock or something. And so. This is the new, these are, I'm not going to try to talk, you know, this, this is not a great slide for this, but you can see these highlighted fields are the new fields. You can see we've added a bunch of things to this format. Okay, so the original Pulse format is this thing, and it's just kind of bare bones. It's just got this very small set of things going on. So the new format is a lot more complicated. This is a better picture of it. So the new format, we've added a whole bunch of different things. But um, the hash, the signage, all these, all these different things. I'm going to talk about some of these fields, and then I'm going to talk about how we have them and what the security guarantees are from them. But this is a, you, know, you can see that the the, um, the pulse format got a lot more complicated. We added a lot to it. Okay. Everything we added was for a good reason. So there are all these administrative fields. The only one that really matters for us is the timestamp. For our discussion now is the timestamp. Okay, because the pulse promises never to release the pulse. Or the beacon promises never to release the pulse before the timestamp. Okay, that's kind of critical. Um, the local random value we have it's called the seed value in the current version. It's called the local random value in the new version. Um, and the idea is that by convention, a beacon should have two or more independent RNGs, hardware RNGs that it uses to generate the random numbers for this for this output, and then it hashes them together. We use SHA five twelve for everything in the in the beacon. Um, and you can, see, you can see the idea, we're concatenating them and then hashing them. Um, now, I have to point out, this is by convention. There's no way to verify that a beacon is actually doing this, because you're just getting a SHA-512 output and it will look random, right? Um, but the, you know, the beacons are supposed to be doing this, and we believe that you know, we, are, we are doing this, and we believe that all the other beacons will be doing this as well. In our case, we're, well, I'll talk about exactly how we're doing it. But, Kind of an important idea here is that if one of the RNGs fails somehow, then we still get good randomness out of this. And there should be no, there should be no observable difference. If one of you, you can let your worst enemy choose one of the RNGs, um, and they still won't be able to do anything to you. Okay, you can kind of see why that should be. So we've also got this idea of what's called an external source, and this is optional. A beacon is not required to do it. We're putting it in the format so it can be done. Um, and the idea is that you might want to incorporate some external public thing. Um, closing prices in the stock market is a good example. Lot of winning lottery numbers. Um, hash, block hashes in Bitcoin. These are all things that are public. They're, they're public. They're easily available. You can always find them. And they're very hard to manipulate. Right? It would cost you, you know, people have actually worked on designing beacons using like block, block hashes from blockchains. And it's possible, but you know, you know, it's possible to to affect these, but they're you know, it would cost a lot of money. Um, so, sort of a, an advantage of this. And this is optional, so no beacon is required to do it. We are not immediately going to be doing this because it introduces a lot of engineering issues. Uh, but eventually, we probably will. Um, there's also this whole set of hash chains, and I'm not going to go into this at all, other than to say that each beacon pulse has a lot of hash chains. I'm going to talk about this. A lot more later in the in the talk, um, but it, every every beacon pulse has many hashes from previous things. This is the other thing that's kind of interesting that's new. It's called a pre-commitment value. So this is the hash of the next pulse's random value, the local random value. Okay, it's not the output, but the the random part. And the reason we have this is to support combining beacons. 
right, combining pulses from two or three different beacons. And I'm going to talk about that a little later, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. But you know, this requires that the beacon generate the generate a pulse one minute in advance so that it knows the next random number. Okay. And that doesn't violate the security requirement. The security requirement is that the beacon promises not to release the pulse until until the time span. So it's okay for it to know it a minute in advance as long as it doesn't release it. So we also have a signature, which is what you would expect. It's an RSA signature. Um, and we have a um, certificate. And so every in the new format, every pulse will carry the hash of the certificate that, that it's using to bind that together with the, with the data in the pulse. Um, the last part of this is the output. And this is sort of interesting. I said before, if somebody's using, if you're using the beacon, you should be using the output field from the pulse, not the, not the, pulse, not the random value. The reason is because the output value is effectively the hash of everything else in the, in the pulse, including the signature. So the idea here is that as an attacker, I can't exert a lot of, you know, even if I'm you know, operating the beacon, I can't exert complete control over this output value. I have to do a brute force sort of attack to control even a few bits of this output value. So this is actually better in terms of, in terms of security than using just the random value that we promise is random, but you can't verify it. So this is my format. This is my big pulse field again. You can see all these all these fields. And this is a nice, if you come back to the slides, I'm, I'm going to send the slides off to you guys. If you come back and look at these slides, this is a nice, kind of almost like a reference card to figure out what's going on. So I've told you how the beacon works, kind of what's going on internally, what the fields are. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the security properties, the security arguments of this. And kind of why we did the things we did, why we added these extra fields. So in order to do that, I want to think about what an attacker wants to do. I'm going to, talk, I'm going to think about these three questions, or these three ideas that an attacker might want to do. He might want to predict future outputs. That, may, that is, he might want to know what the pulses are going to be long in advance. He might want to influence the outputs, which is even stronger than predicting. Right? So you might want to say, you know, I'm running this election and I already know which precincts I can, I can cook and which ones I can't, so I need to force the beacon pulse at this time to be something that will not ever cause me to audit those, the, the places where I know I'm, I'm, I'm going to cook the books. Um, we also might want, the, an attacker also might want to change history to alter the old beacon pulses. Right? Um, and in particular, because we're talking about a service that we want to be trusted and, and used widely, um, and it's a service that, that we're running and then there's going to be these other two organizations and hopefully more running. We want to think in terms of the attacker being inside our, our kind of trust boundary. So we want to think about what can the beacon operator do if he's evil? What can, what can we do if we control some components of the beacon, right? If I, if I get to choose one of the RNGs, what happens? Things like that. So, you know, if I, if I want to predict future outputs, the only way that, that it seems possible to predict future outputs is to compromise the beacon engine. And the reason why is because we have two different hardware RNGs that we're you're using to generate these random numbers every time. If either of those hardware RNGs is really unpredictable and, and the beacon engine is working properly, then there's no way to predict future outputs, right? So the only way to do this is to compromise the beacon engine. If you compromise the beacon engine, obviously if you're the beacon operator, you already have done that, you don't have to do anything. If you're an outsider, you have to figure out how to communicate with it and, and get a message into it that does a buffer, buffer overrun or something and take it over. If you can take over the beacon engine, then it's really easy to predict, to know all the future outputs, right? Because you remember the local random value, it just looks random. And that's the only thing that's unpredictable in this, in this, you know, in this pulse format. Um, so basically what's gonna, what you're going to do as an attacker is you just seed a good PRNG, use that to provide the local random values from now on, and now you know every output value forever. So if somebody were using the beacon to run a lottery, this would be really useful, right? If you compromise the engine, you would know the winning lottery numbers forever, right? Um, don't use it to run a lottery because I don't think we're secure. I don't think we can do security well enough to prevent an attacker can get millions of dollars out of it, right? <laughs> Um, so, where do we go from there? So, how the kind of question you might ask is how far into the future an attacker can can carry out his attack? And there are really two cases here. If we're using this external source that I talked about, this is the reason for the external source. If we're using the external source, let's say we're using closing stock market prices, then we can say nobody's 
nobody really knows the exact closing prices of like the closing S&P 500, you know, closing stock prices a day in advance, right? If you, if you can predict financial market outcomes that far, you don't have to compromise the beacon. You can already take over the world because you can get infinitely rich, right? Um, so if we're using an external source, then I, as an attacker, can know the outputs until that next external value becomes available, right? So maybe a day in advance I can know the outputs. But I can't know the outputs a year in advance because I can't know what the closing prices of the stock markets will be. If I'm not using an external source, then as an attacker, I can, I can know those outputs pretty much forever, right? Because I've just seeded the RNG and decided what they're going to be forever. And as long, until my compromise is discovered, at least, I will be able to know all those future outputs. So that's one of the arguments for using the external source, right? Is it takes an attacker who's compromised, a very powerful attacker who's compromised the beacon engine, or even the beacon operator who's evil, you still can't, you still can only know the, the results a, a day in advance, right? So it's more powerful, in, in a lot of ways it's more valuable to control the outputs, right? So just knowing the outputs is not as, as helpful in some ways as being able to say, I don't like that output, I'm going to change it. So this is the reason why the output value, this is the whole formula for computing the output value. We're hashing all the fields other than the signature value and the output value. And then we're passing that hash over to the signature. And then we're signing, or we're hashing the concatenation of the signature and the hash. Um, one interesting thing here is, in the current field, we're just um, hashing the signature and not the other, the, not, the, not the hash of the other fields as well. That there's actually a security issue there. Um, first of all, there's an issue because I'll show you about how you can check the hash chains um, to verify that something hasn't changed. And we lose, so, you know, basically, the verification of these chains would become a lot less efficient if, if we didn't hash these other fields. But there's also this issue that this is an RSA signature. If the signature parameters are, val are, are legitimate, then we get this nice hash chain through everything, every, everything is verified. However, you can imagine somebody putting in invalid um, RSA parameters so that, for example, the RSA signing algorithm is not, um, is not invertible. And in that case, you could actually introduce collisions. So there's a good reason for having these, all these other fields hashed. Um, so that when we're in this world where, where you know, an attack is trying to control the output value, the only way to do it, assuming SHA-512 is good, and we assume, roughly assuming that SHA-512 behaves like a random oracle, um, is the best we can do is to control, to control some bits is to try a lot of values, try a lot of inputs and see if we can get something to, to get a particular value. So if we want to control k bits of, of output, obviously it's 2 to the k, we need to choose 2 to the k valid pulses and we have to form them so that they'll be a valid pulse, they'll be accepted by the world. So remember, this is the, the assumption here is I've compromised the beacon engine and I'm trying to control some output bits. So in this case, I have to, I have to construct 2 to the k valid ones to control k bits of output. Right. That seems pretty straightforward. So suppose, let's suppose, and this is why we have a, one of the reasons why we have a hardware security module. We have a you know, uh, an external device that stores the, the RSA key and does the signing, okay? One reason we have this, let's suppose that you as an attacker take over the Beacon engine, the, the Windows machine, but you can't get, you can't break the key out of the HSM, okay? In that case, you're actually really limited because for each attempted, um, you know, each, you know to, control, to control 20 bits, you need to do two to the 20 different, different valid pulses but your every try of that is going to have to go through the hardware security module to produce a valid signature. So, as an attacker, you can't parallelize your attack. You're limited to just this one device that you have to you have to hit it as quickly as you can with signature requests. Um, I guess you probably have to find out how fast you can hit it before you eventually overheat the thing or something. Um, you know, so, if you if you imagine that we can do ten signatures a second. You could, in principle, do a million signatures a day, roughly, and, and so you control 20 bits if you had a day to, to work on it. Okay. Now, I say 20 bits for a day. Um, obviously, double the amount of time, you get one more bit. So two days, it's 21 bits. Four days, it's 22 bits. So it's you know, it's you, you have some control, but not a huge amount, right? And this can't be parallelized because you have to go through the HSM. So. If you've compromised the, the beacon engine and the HSM, if you're the beacon operator, you just know everything, 
or if some, maybe there's a weakness in the HSM as well, and once you compromise the engine, you somehow got the key out of the HSM. Now, in that case, you can parallelize everything. So you still have to do RSA signatures. You have to do a new, every time you want to try a new beacon pulse, you generate a new random number, you um, do a new signature, and then you do the hash. So we, if, if we imagine we could do um, you know, a million signatures per second, RSA signatures per second, doing it in parallel, um, then we could figure we could control about 36 bits a day. Now, both of these numbers, these depend on, on the number of signatures per second you can do, but you can kind of get a sense of this. And once again, you double the amount of time you have to work on it, and you add one more bit. So with two days, it's 37 bits. With, with four days, it's 38 bits. And you might be able to do a little better than that. I don't know, you know, you have to kind of assume some set of resources to figure out how many RSA signatures you could compute in parallel per day. So, I guess the, the kind of big picture with all that before I talk about hash chains is um, when, you, when you think about these, these attacks on controlling the outputs, I guess I should, I should come back and, and talk about this. Controlling the outputs has the same property that the external, about the external source that, that predicting the outputs does. So if you, you, if you wanted to control the outputs, you want to control the output that's going to come a year in advance, you do this big pre-computation, if you don't have an external source, you can spend a year doing this pre-computation to try to control as many bits as possible. If you have the external source, then obviously maybe it's once a day, so you'd only have a day to do this pre-computation. So that's actually another reason for the external source. So, kind of the, the additional thing I wanted to talk about here, it looks like, yeah, I've got about another half hour or so. Um, is this question of what keeps the beacon operator from rewriting history. So um, a big idea here, once again, we want to we think in terms of the beacon operator as being potentially an attacker. So <coughs> what can the beacon operator do? And then we want to say, what prevents, what in this format prevents the, the beacon operator from changing an old pulse? So if you think about the context here, right, I have the, the NIST beacon has all of its old pulses stored. And you can come and ask for, you can ask for a chain. So you can go to the the website and you can say, give me every pulse from January 1st, 19, year, oh, 19, January 1st of 2013 to, or maybe of 2015 to, you know, to today. And you could, in principle, you'd have to hit it several times, but you could get that entire chain. Okay. And the kind of question you might ask is, you know, maybe I'm looking at the beacon pulse from, from December 1st, and I want to and I want to verify it's some use that somebody else did. Somebody did this and used it for like a trial for a drug, a drug trial or something for randomizing their their patients. I would like to verify that I've got the right pulse and that that the beacon operator couldn't have changed the pulse later on to change the results, right? So I want to look up this pulse and verify that it's the right value, and I want to know that it couldn't have been changed. So. The answer for why this can't be changed comes down to a structure called a data structure called a hash chain, and then this other thing that we're doing that's it's a, we're calling it a skip list. It's related to the computer science idea of a skip list, but it's not quite as it's not quite identical. And I'm going to show you both of these. So in order to go forward, this is a, an illustration of the whole pulse, right? This has too many fields. If I try to put this all on the board, it won't be readable. So I'm just going to without any further discussion, omit most of the fields from my representation, and I'm going to shorten a couple names, and I just want to be clear, the fields are still there. I'm talking about whole pulses here, even though I'm only showing maybe one field or just a couple fields at a time. So I'm doing this just for readability. So here is a sequence of, of pulses that make up a hash chain. So the idea, remember the output value is effectively the hash of everything else in the pulse. And every pulse has this previous field that is the output value from the previous pulse. So you can, you can easily, you can kind of see the hash of the first pulse winds up being in the second pulse, and then it gets hashed, and that goes into the third, it goes into the fourth. So you have a hash chain, right? So why is a hash chain useful here? Well, the idea is, um, because hashes are collision resistant, um, once you if I wanted to make a change to a, to, a, to a hash chain somewhere in the back, so I'm, I'm changing the second field, I'm going to just change the random number, that requires, if I want to make, actually make the hash chain or make the sequence of pulses be valid, I have to now recompute that output value, which has to have changed. 
if that hasn't changed, then I've got a collision in the, in the hash function. And then I've got to go and loop that forward and recompute the hash and recompute the hash and so on. So it goes forward. So this is a hash chain. This is a really useful thing. Um, blockchains always have a hash chain as part of the thing that makes, you know, that prevents changes to the past. And we're incorporating the same idea. And that's in the existing beacon format as well as the new one. So how do we detect changes in this chain? Well, if you think about it, let's suppose I changed something here a couple steps back. So you're trying to check this, this chain, and you know what the last, the last pulse is. Maybe you've seen it, it's widely attested. And you want to verify that <coughs> nothing in the past has changed. So what you're going to do is you're going to, go, you're going to verify this entire chain. So let's suppose I made this change, but I didn't, I didn't update the output value for it right, in this second pulse. In that case, when you get to that pulse, you'll check that hash and you'll know this is wrong. You'll, you'll derive a new, you, you will get a different value for output value than, than is in the chain, and then you'll know that there's, there's a problem. If I stuck that forward one, then obviously then you go to the next field and you won't get the right, right hash value. And you can guarantee that this propagates, that if, if there is a change anywhere in this hash chain, that it, you know, it, will, it will change the final output value. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So, if you just look at this, this is, this is the kind of critical idea, right? Is you've got this, this hash chain going on. So you've got the hash of the hash of the hash, everything in there. So, the result of this is that there's no rewriting history. If, if I've seen the last pulse, then once I've seen a particular pulse, any pulse earlier than that can't have been changed. You, know, you can't change it once you've shown me pulse right now. You can't change any pulse in the past without me being able to tell if I look at the chain. So the good news is that this is, this is doable. right? You can actually check this chain. The bad news is these chains get really long. It's about 1,440 pulses a day. Well, it should be exactly. Right? How many minutes are there in a day? So let's suppose, in this case is only about three days, Let's suppose I know this pulse is good, and I want to go back and check a pulse three days earlier, and I just want to verify that nothing has changed. The problem is, these are only a, a few days apart, but I've still got about 3,000 pulses between these. So this chain is really long, okay? And so there's a solution for this, and to describe the solution, I first need to describe what the, um, the fields look like. The basic solution is going to be to take this long chain and extract a subset that lets you, that, that is still an intact hash chain. Okay. So you're going to take this, this 3,000 pulse sequence and extract, you know, maybe eight or nine pulses that still make an intact hash chain. So I'll show you how this works here in a sec. So, again, I'm, I want to talk about these fields that I kind of skipped over before. These are new fields in the pulse. There's, along with previous, there's also hour, day, month, year. They, all of these have the output value from some previous pulse, okay? And so obviously previous is the previous pulse, just like it says on the, on the label. Um, the first pulse of each hour is recorded, the first pulse of each day, each month, and each year. All this is UTC, right? Or, to, or GMT, equivalently, or Zulu time, or whatever, right? So it's, you have to do universal time. Um, and so, each of these, you know, if, if you look at this, you can kind of see this. I've tried to illustrate this with the time. So, for 2019, April 25th, at 4.16, well, obviously, 4 o'clock is the first pulse that hour. Midnight on 4.25 is the first pulse that day. Midnight on April 1st is the first pulse that month. And midnight at, on January 1st is the first pulse that year. So, this is not too hard to understand. And it's kind of interesting to note, those fields are all, usually they're all different, but they're not always all different. So here's an example where the first pulse of the hour and the first pulse of the day will be the same, and then the first pulse of the month and the first pulse of the year are the same, right? So, so why would we do this? So the reason we do this is to, have a, is to make an intact um, skip list, an intact chain uh, that extracts a very small subset of records. So you can see, in this case, um, I, I was thinking I might draw this on the board because it's probably easier to do with a, with a picture. Ah, it's white chalk. It's a chalkboard, this is, this is kind of old, old fashioned. So the, 
a core thing you have to understand. Each pulse has the first pulse that year in it. Okay. So if you look, go back to 2020, like this thing, November 17th, it has the first pulse of 2020 or 2022 in it. Hmm. I should say 2020. Sorry, that's a typo. Okay. So it has the first pulse of the year 2020 in it. And so the first thing we're going to do, and let me go back to there. That's actually. Let me let me do, let me work this example because it'll be easier to easier to see. So. We're talking. We're starting with with 2021, 11:30. Okay. So this is you know I have I know this pulse is good. I want to prove that this pulse that is several years back is good. And there's a huge number of pulses in between here. So what we're going to do is go from here back to the first pulse that year. Okay. That's January 1st. And then that pulse will contain the first pulse of the previous year, the first pulse of the previous year, and the first pulse of the previous year. So we can, so if we get the first pulse from 2020, from 2021 contains as its previous year field, the first pulse from 2020. 2020 contains the first pulse from 2019. 2019 contains the first pulse from, you know, you know first, the, I guess this 2020 contains the first pulse from the previous month. That goes to the previous day, and then we go up from there. So I don't know if I'm illustrating this well. So in this case, if you think about it, you know, you're looking at, I don't know if, how to, if I can draw it quickly. Um, 2020 has this, this thing has a field this year. It has the first pulse that year. That goes up to 2021. That one goes up to 2020, 2019, and then all the way out. So is that at all clear? I need to try to draw a diagram. So you can, if you visualize this, it's like a skip list. <laughs> so you think about this pulse at 2021, 11, 1130. It contains the year, the first year field that links back to 2021, 01, 01. Sorry, John, we don't really see that. Oh. Okay. Um, right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to illustrate it better than just describing it. So, so you create the skip list from an existing hash chain. I'm sorry. You create the skip list from an existing hash chain. Yes. Yes. So the idea is that the entire sequence, the entire sequence has these fields for the previous field, and then also for the first field that hour, that day, that month, and that year. Okay. So that's why there's an, there are a whole bunch of different intact hash chains in this sequence of, of pulses. And the, you, when we do this extract, what we do is we try to pull a minimal subset out that's still an intact hash chain. And that's why I'm saying that there's an intact hash chain that you know, the hash of this, of this 2019, 11, 29, 2300 is in that next pulse. The hash of that is in that next pulse, that next pulse, that next pulse, and that next pulse. So we have an intact hash chain all the way through, even though we're only giving like nine records, right? And the kind of the critical thing here is the uh, the new beacon format or the new the beacon engine will be, or I guess the beacon front end. You can request this sort of a proof. So it will give you this. If you say I believe this pulse and I want to see that pulse, it will give you the minimal chain for that. So you request it, it'll give you a minimal hash chain that's still an intact hash chain. So. I hope that's clear. So I want to talk about one more thing here. Let me jump over here. Right, so I guess I, sh I should be clear. The, this, this interface, the reason why this is important is because we want people to be able to check this. So just having the hash chain in and of itself is not so useful because, you know, nobody can, you know, it's, it's like, if you wanted to check this thing with three, if it's three years apart, it would be, you know, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of records. And so it would take a huge amount of work to check it. With this, we can allow anybody who, just, who wants to, to just spontaneously check a previous pulse, and we'll give them a very efficient check that's only like nine or 10, 10 hashes. So the last security thing I want to talk about is about combining beacons. So to combining beacons, what I want to do is we know that a corrupt beacon operator can can know future outputs or control future outputs. 
And this is, an ob this is obviously an issue if you want to use this beacon for something where there's a lot of money involved or where you just had a trust issue. If you want to do elections, okay, this is part of the U.S. government. Maybe you don't want to have the U.S. government have control of your elections. Um, so the sort of a, one nice solution for this is to combine outputs from multiple beacons. So there's nobody, you know, there's no one beacon that can screw you over. It would have to be a, com a combination of multiple. So this is just some notation I'm going to use for talking about this. And I, you know, if you see this A sub T, this is the beacon pulse at time T from beacon A. Okay, And then T plus 1 and T minus 1 are the next and previous pulses. So I'm skipping over the fact that different pulses could have different frequencies. You could have one that was issuing pulses once, one per minute, one per second. I'm just assuming that we can figure out which the next and previous ones are. And I'm also going to use this notation like from Python or C of, of you know, the field name says, you know, just putting a dot there. So local dot, a, a sub t dot local random value is the local random value field from time t. Okay. So if you wanted to combine beacons, there's a sort of an obvious dumb thing to do that doesn't work, which is you might just take the output values and export them together. Okay. Now, probably you can figure out why this doesn't work, but the, the basic problem is, let's say I'm the good beacon and Elena is the, running the evil beacon, then what we do is we, you know, I generate my output value and then she looks and sees what my output value is and she makes up another value of her own to combine, you know, to control it so that, you know, she forces the low bits to be zero or something, right? So if there's, if there are two people control, you know, if, if there are two beacons and one of them is evil, we wind up, if you do the sort of dumb combining, we wind up with, with the evil beacon having just as much control as you did if you just used the, use the evil beacon directly, right? So it's not, this isn't all that helpful, right? So if that doesn't work, how, how should we do it? This is, um, this, this is the recommendation we have, and this is it's a document that we're writing, and this is the you know, sort of the basic formula here. We have to take the pulses at time t minus one from each of the two beacons. Let's say that I let's say that, that I'm combining two beacons that are running from different organizations. So I'm going to take the at time t minus one, so a minute ago, I'm going to be looking at these pulses when they first come out, and I'm going to record those those pulses. And then when the next pulses come from each of these from these beacons, so the time t pulses, I'm going to check that the pre-commitment value is correct. Remember the pre-commitment value commits to the random field, the local random value field in the next pulse. So what's happening is when A and T send out their, their pulses, now they are committing to what random value they will use in the next pulse. And once they've committed to it, they can't change it, right? This is not exactly a commitment in the sense that you do write proofs about usually because it's, you know, you can, you can do brute force checking, but in this case it works. Okay. So, you, so what we're going to do at the end is we're going to compute this combined value that takes the, the local random values, I don't know why that says raw, but the local random values from the from time t pulses and combine that along with the, the, the um, output values from the previous pulses. And we're going to hash that all together to get a combined output. So there, the two things we're doing that are important here are we're checking the pre-commitment value, right? So once your, once your beacon has sent out a pulse at time t, it can't, it can no longer make any choices about what it's going to send out at pulse t time, pulse um, t plus one, right? It's the only thing it has any control over is the local random value, and it's just lost that control because it's committed to the next value. And the same thing is true for, um, you know, it's true for both beacon pulses, for both beacons. So if B is the even, evil beacon, at time t minus one, as it sends out its pulse, it no longer has any choice about what to send out for, for time t, okay? The other thing that happens is because we're, ha is we're hashing all these together, so as an attack, even if you, ha if, even if you were an attacker who had some, you had the ability to exert a little bit of control, you have a lot less control over the hashed output value, so you can just choose bits. The, the really important thing here is, this, is using this pre-commit. We also are including those output values because those bind things. If, if you imagine a situation where an attacker had um, compromised the beacon engines and HSMs of both um, both beacon, like both of the two beacons, then we would like them to still have some limits on how much control they could exert. And by incorporating output value, which incorporates the signatures, we actually 
limit their ability to, to control those outputs even there, right? So what is the attack here? So we just said, basically this is a very standard thing to do. I want to combine random numbers from two people, so I'm going to make them each commit to the random number and then reveal the random numbers. And there's a pretty obvious attack here. The attack is beacon A sends out its pulse, beacon B sends out its pulse, they've committed to the next pulses, and then on the ne at the next time, beacon A, the good beacon, sends out its pulse, and beacon B says, oh, I don't like what the output of this combined random number is going to be, what do I do? I'm going to hit the reset button. So I'm just going to say, sorry, I had a system crash, I lost the pulses, what can you do? You know, computers, they're hard. And, you know, that's, that's, where, you're, that's where you're stuck. So basically, as long as, as the evil beacon can um, simulate a failure, then it can, it can basically abandon, it, it basically supports the protocol. So this gives the attacker, this gives an evil beacon a little bit of control. Um, they can't control bits, they can't control a lot. What they can do is they can hit the reset button and say, I don't want this next random number once. Okay. So how do you solve that? Well, there's not a good solution in our in you know, in, in our setup right now, the solution that we have is to is that the beacons want to keep a reputation for reliability. So it's not gonna work for it's not gonna work well for a beacon as far as its reputation if it crashes every week or crashes every other day or something. Right? Um, and the other thing is that a crash at a really convenient moment, any crashes that you do where you say, I've lost the pulse forever, if you just say, oh, my front end crashed, but I got it back, it, it came back up in an hour, and now here's the pulse, that doesn't hurt anything for combining beacons, right? Because we still have the pre-commitment values. The place where we have a problem is, uh, you know, is if, you, if you say, I lost the pulse, it's gone forever, and then I have to leave a gap in my chain. So there's no way to hide the fact that you've left gaps in your chain. So the best solution we have for right now for the beacons within this format is to count on, on reputation. There are actually a bunch of other ways to try to solve this problem, right? Um, one of the ones uh, if you've seen at Randau, it's, it's an Ethereum thing where, you know, because you're dealing with money, it's smart contracts, you're dealing with money. So everybody who's con contributing to the random number, you contribute the pre-commitment, you contribute a committed, the commitment to the random number and also performance bond. And if you don't reveal a random number, then you lose your performance bond, right? So this is a nice game theory solution to this problem. It's not crypto exactly; it's, it's game theory, but it's you know you have an incentive as long as it's as long as controlling the random number is worth less to you than the performance bond, you'll never you'll never award. Um, there actually are other things. Lenstra had this cool thing called Sloth. Lenstra and uh, I forget who else was on that paper, but um, it was basically there's a you know, a thing where I get lots of people to contribute randomness, and then I compute a very slow function that I can guarantee can't be computed in less than, let's say, a day. And then I publish the result, and he, the, the clever thing there was a, an efficient proof that the result was correct. So everybody didn't have to redo the, the slow computation. That's another way to try to solve this problem of somebody hitting the reset button, is basically you contribute the randomness, and then it'll be a day before you know whether you should abort the protocol or not by not sending your numbers. Um, there's also this thing by Sita, I think, at all. That's a variable secret sharing, verifiable secret sharing in Byzantine agreement protocol that does this. Um, I did a paper with uh, Peter Mel and James Shook at NIST recently on doing something like this with the Ethereum smart contract. Um, and there's another solution there. Um, our solution involved making beacons that were actually didn't have any randoms, any randomness in them, and their whole chain of, of values was committed. To so there are a bunch of other possible solutions to this. The solution we came to for the for the beacon project, at least for now, is basically just forcing it is basically just saying, well, you're going to have to be visible. Anything bad you do as far as bailing out and losing pulses, you're gonna have to be visible in the chain. And hopefully your reputation will keep going. So that's the big picture. Um, We've had this, I, I think public random numbers are a really useful thing to have, and I don't know how well I've made the case for you to you of that, but I think they're actually a really useful service. Um, running a beacon service is kind of a nice way of providing them. Running it as an explicit service has the advantage that it give you, we can say, we can give exactly what we think we, people need, like efficient checking and stuff. The downside is that you have to trust the people running the service. So to try to mitigate that, we, we've constructed this, pull, this beacon pulse format 
that limits our power as the beacon operator, um, and that, that encourages people to combine beacon pulses from multiple different sources. Um, we still have to worry about some issues like the simulated failure kind of hitting the reset button attack. Um, but I think we've made some pretty good progress on it. And that's it. And this is the picture. And now you can maybe follow some more of this picture where you've got the output fields from the earlier pulses, you know, going forward, you know, coming back, and then you're constructing this pulse. You, you can see the random number generator where, where we're producing the, the next local random value and, and hashing it for the pre-commitment value. So you kind of maybe see some of what's going on in here. Um, and that's it. So thanks a lot.